if a new job or if a job like project manager. Project manager has been the same job for five decades in terms of the actual job title. But what's happening underneath that job in terms of the technical skills, the soft skills, the tools, the technologies to do that job is constantly changing. So what our deep learning is doing is it's taking every job available in the entire labor market and it's looking at all of those changes in real time. So if you and your background had project manager, you're going to be able to see an up-to-date skill set based on what that, that job entails today. Hello, welcome to Coffee with Mr. IoT. My name is Robert Schmidt. I'm Deloitte's Chief Futurist, also known as Mr. IoT. Today on my show, we have Sean Hinton, the CEO and founder of Skyhive. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. What's Skyhive? So Skyhive, well, let me back up a little bit. Uh, in 2016, a group of Syrian women changed my life. And uh, what Sorry, happened? one more time. Sure. You grew up what? A group of. A group of, okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, the World Bank forecasts that by 2023, more than 52% of the world's workforce will need to be reskilled. Just recently, Amazon announced a $700 million investment to uh, reskill and upskill over 100,000 workers. Skyhive is uh, the world's first deep learning technology that focuses uh, purely on reskilling of companies and, and people. And so we extract skills from jobs, skills from people, and we find efficiencies and correlations in the movement of human capital. So I want to use, this is fascinating to me, um, it's AI, right? And many people talk about AI like it's the big dark thing out there. But here is a great example of, I think, where we can dive in. Sort of like, tell us a little bit more, where do, what, deep learning, what's deep learning versus AI? And how does it actually work? What's the AI, the deep learning part in all of this? Sure. So in our case, uh, we have uh, layers of AI. So we have everything from natural language processing that processes data, the stuff that goes out to the internet and takes data and brings it in. So I sign up. I come on. I sign up on Skyhive. You mm -hmm. take my profile and you take the data and then the NLP looks at all my words and everything. Yeah, so in the case of if you're signing up on Skyhive, you would just simply upload your resume and all, all, automatically a, a skills profile is created from you. That's natural language processing. It's okay. reading the document you've uploaded and it's extracting data from that document. So then there's machine learning and machine learning is often confused with AI. Machine learning goes back to even Amazon recommends, you know, back 10, 12, 13 years ago. Uh, where we're looking at one piece of information and connecting it with another piece of information on a particular database. When you get into deep learning or neural networks, you're talking about the machine thinking for itself. So we've given it some parameters through which it can think, and then we fill it with data, and then it's making decisions on what to do and how to arrange that data based on the parameters that it's been given. So it's learning as it, as it goes. This is a neural network deep learning technology. So, took my resume, NLP made skills out of this. I don't know, how many skills are there in your database? A thousand? Fifty? What? About seven thousand. Seven thousand. Okay, so it picks and says, out of this I have, okay, I'm going to be aggressive, maybe fifty. Right. Or what's the typical skill? Yeah, thirty count? to fifty. Thirty to fifty. 30. Oh, okay, so thirty. Um, and then it goes and puts this into, into the ML, the machine learning. The machine learning then takes that and maps it to other skills? Exactly. So it's thinking, it's, it's, it's looking at the data that comes out of that resume. It's saying, okay, now let's take that data and look at the database of total skills, total activity right now on, on the database. And now we're coming back to you, to your profile and saying, these are the skills that are prominent within your, within your background. Okay. And then the deep learning part is which part now? The deep learning part is the part that is the, that document is comparing to. So it's saying, okay, there's yesterday's skills and six months ago and a year ago. And how are all of those skills changing? So for example, if a new job or if a job like project manager, 
project manager has been the same job for five decades in terms of the actual job title. But what's happening underneath that job in terms of the technical skills, the soft skills, the tools, the technologies to do that job is constantly changing. So what our deep learning is doing is it's taking every job available in the entire labor market and it's looking at all of those changes in real time. So if you and your background had project manager, you're going to be able to see an up-to-date skill set based on what that, that job entails today. I have to tell you, this might be the best explanation of an AI, AI with an example I've ever heard. I love this. Thank and you. by the way, it doesn't sound scary suddenly, does it? I mean, I don't know. There's this whole thing about AI is going to take my job away. I, could a human being just do, even do what we just said? And how long would it take a human being to do this for one person? No, and that's a really good example. I mean, my company, Skyhive, is a B corporation. So there's a lot of uh, social impact focus. We want to help companies and communities reskill. Uh, mm -hmm. and be prepared for the changing nature of the future of work. Uh, AI in and of itself is not scary. It's the applications of AI that could be scary, right? So in our case, we, what we do is, I mean, you would need thousands of people crunching information all at the same time, and who would want to do that 24 hours a day? Because we built an AI that can do that, that's no longer required. And so you're able to do things with data and information in a positive way that can help us understand things better and advance more rapidly. In terms of the, the changing nature of work and jobs, um, there are virtually zero jobs or very few jobs that are going to be fully automated. And so there'll be 20% of a job automated, 40% of a job automated, not 100% of a job. And so the question is, as it relates to future of work and reskilling, the real critical question is, what are we doing to help people understand what to do with that 40% or that 20% because that's far more interesting work than whatever is being automated. Like invoicing, for example. If somebody's job, 40% of their job is to do invoicing all day, well, if we had a, a technology that could do that automatically, that would free that person up to do more interesting things in the company, and that's really what we're trying to get to the heart of. I'm always curious, particularly with startups like yours, um, I often have this question about um, Jeff Bezos when he started selling books online. Did he think that he's going to actually uh, have Amazon Web Services as a company later on? I have to admit I doubt it. I think this developed over time. Yeah. Uh, but from, for you, my question to you is how did you come up with this idea and then what has changed since the day of you starting to today? Yeah, and so that really speaks to, to my background. So prior to uh, launching Skyhive, I was president of the world's largest water park company. So it was an international company that was focused on the architectural, uh, architecture, engineering, uh, manufacturing, and construction project management of water parks and, and water park attractions. Um, Quite a shift from... I was going to say, today. it's a natural transition <laughs> yeah, exactly. to go into AI. But really. <laughs> what a lot of people don't think about is that that industry, the water park industry, is an extremely dangerous industry in the sense that people are going down slides at you know four meters per second, five meters per second with no straps, no harnesses, eight degrees of human movement, etc. So there's a lot of sophistication that goes into the engineering and design. So you know if I made a, an AI that recommended a skill that was maybe a stupid skill that didn't make sense, that's not really harming anyone. But in my past life, if we built something that, that wasn't uh, too exact specifications, we could really harm somebody. Anyways, prior to the water park industry, I spent 10 years uh, consulting to the government of Canada in labor economics and labor mobility. And so spent thousands of hours understanding the movement of people, the recognition of credentials, competency mapping, and the gaps that existed between what our idea of a labor market was and what a fluid labor market was. So fast forward to 2016, um, a group of Syrian women had escaped uh, Syria during the Civil War. Uh, I'm a member of the Young Presidents Organization and attended the YPO Glo Global Congress in Dubai. That group of Syrian women spoke to us and talked about the atrocities of the treatment of women during the Syrian Civil War. And that immediately uh, shifted my mindset and gave me a purpose to want to uh, do a small thing to contribute to the world in terms of what my energy and experience would be. And I realized as an employer and as someone who had spent a lot of time focused on skills and labor economics, that we all have gifts and talents and abilities 
but we don't necessarily explicitly know what they are. If I asked you, Robert, what are your 30 to 50 skills, you go, maybe you get eight, 10, you know, <laughs> off the top of your head. Um, and I was thinking to myself, well, with advancements in computing power and the reduction of cost to access that computing power, why are we still in this situation? When we can crunch a lot of information at the same time, why are we still in this situation that we don't actually know what those skills and capabilities are? And then we definitely don't know how to apply them to a context of a labor market. And so if I'm a welder and I've been welding uh, for 20 years, what if my job ends tomorrow and there's no other welding jobs available and I have to go and find something else to do? Why don't we have a technology that helps people understand that the skills and, and abilities that you learned as a welder are extremely valuable to a number of different occupations. You just don't know what those are. And we've been able to prove amazing use cases with that, with coal workers, for example, that are, uh, we're able to shift them in terms of uh, recognizing their prior skills, moving them into training and upskilling to get them into um, uh, new environmental technologies, renewable energy type work. That is the future. And so, uh, and how has it changed? Oh. Um, the applications of our technology are, are, are quite broad and far broader than I would have expected. Our main uh, clients are Fortune 500 companies and, and governments, so we work with the military, we, we work with very, very large, sophisticated companies. And I had really built the technology for that welder, and I didn't realize that it was capable of doing so much more. Uh, amazingly fascinating, right? I sit here and I kind of like my mind goes to, well, how do I know that you picked the right 30 skills and how do you know that those skills apply and really it only shows in true use cases like you said when a co-worker suddenly gets reskilled and used um, an amazing example and I love the example. Um, you talked about something that um, triggered something else in my mind. You talked about this experience with the Syrian women and how you were driven to do a different job, do something different. Um, I want to ask you a personal question. How has this changed you personally? Not professionally what you do, but also personally. I'm curious about that. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, it was that day that I found what I say I found my purpose. And what that means is the definition of purpose for me prior to that was an academic exercise where I would sit with executive coaches or organizational behavioral you know, consultants, and we would write on whiteboards what you know, some words that we would define as our purpose. That moment defined my purpose and what, what I define, my own definition of what purpose is now is it's an undying sort of love affair with solving a problem. It doesn't matter if you're accepted or rejected. It doesn't matter if you succeed or fail. You'll continue to get up every single day and pursue solving that, that, that problem or fulfilling that purpose. And so, uh, and that has been every single day for me since that moment. Uh, and, it, and it's an absolute pleasure to be able to have the opportunity to be, you know, in San Francisco at the Singularity University Global Summit, speaking on stage on the future of work and having this conversation with you. It's an absolute pleasure to be able to do that. That's my purpose. So. It's great. I mean, I, I sort of sit here with you and maybe this comes across or maybe it doesn't to the film, but I feel that passion in you. I feel that purpose in you. Have you talked to the Syrian woman again? No. No, but I did have the amazing pleasure of being invited to speak on that very stage earlier this year at the AI Everything Conference in Dubai, and that was an extremely special moment for me, where three years ago I was sitting in the audience having my purpose defined for me, and three years later I got to go back and speak on that stage uh, and talk about AI and the future of work. So that was a really special moment. Awesome, I love that. Um, how do you keep as the CEO to solving problems and not becoming uh, just a spokesperson or management or you know something like this. How, how do you make sure you stay true to that purpose and driving that? That was probably the hardest part of building the company. Was was you know part of my purpose walking out that day was to create a company that at its very core could be wildly successful from a P and L perspective, but drive social impact in tandem. And that's not an easy exercise. You know, we're not talking about a CSR exercise within an organization or some sort of uh, giving pledge, I'm sorry, corporate social responsibility initiative uh, or a giving pledge or something like that. We're talking about creating a company that at its core can do both things. 
And, and so I spent a lot of time articulating that and using sort of every bit of experience and knowledge that I had because I didn't have a model available to me to, to, to go from. And so how I, how I maintain that purpose is uh, we pursue partnerships uh, with um, six underrepresented groups. Uh, in North America, seven underrepresented groups in total. These are the groups that if today you opened up the newspaper, you would see record low unemployment. Everybody's talking about record low unemployment. But if you turn to page two and you look at uh, unemployment within groups, women, youth, indigenous communities, Latino communities, physically disabled, veterans, immigrants, or in the case of international refugees, you see double-digit unemployment growth, huge gap between the rich and the poor, huge wage gaps, etc. And so we uh, do partnerships with organizations and we provide our technology for the purposes of advancing R&D uh, to support access to employment and career development for those communities. Uh, so that's one way that we keep focused on that. But I think more importantly, in terms of how do we keep and maintain that culture within our organization. We have a governance structure that's extremely focused and supportive on this. So B Corp is one where you actually have to go in and when you're incorporating your business and doing your articles of incorporation, you have to clearly state that the business is being uh, built just you know, also for the value creation of shareholders, but also for the value creation of society. In addition to that, it's very important to build a board, an advisory group in a village of supporters around the company that share that mission alignment. Uh, thirdly, it's important that when I have opportunities like this to speak, that I'm not spending my time with you solely talking about technology and AI, but we're able to get into this discussion as well, and so people can understand that there's more to this than just an interesting technology. I, I really got this aspect of what you do with my resume. I want to shift to two other spots, and let me start with the obvious one, which is the corporations. Uh, how does this impact corporations? Is this about corporations analyzing the skills they have and complementing this? Is this Amazon figuring out where they put their $700 million? Uh, how do corporations use your, technolo your technology, your solution? Yeah, so I think in 2017, the World Economic Forum released a, a very pivotal report that talked about the future of work. And they talked about a 10-point plan for helping solve that, that future. The number one on that list was reskilling, but it went into all sorts of different areas around training, development of employees, the changing uh, physical workplace, those types of, of things. Um, so the first question a company is going to ask itself is to say, what is the work of the future? How do I prepare my company for what is coming in the future with all of this uh, rapid digital transformation and disruption happening in all facets of, of our business? How do we actually look forward? Well, to look forward, you have to look at the present first. And you need to understand what are the skill sets of my company right now? And so that's kind of the starting point where companies come to Skyhive is because they, they want to have a better sense of the skill sets in their company now, not only their skill set, their skill sets internally, but the skill sets in the industry that they're in, uh, or in the labor market at large, and so uh, th that's where our technology uh, comes into play. Uh, usually from from the beginning, where we go in and we'll integrate with an existing uh, technology that has, in, 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 you know, the the snapshot of employees, and then we're able to say, okay, this is the skill set that you have today. These are the skills. Oh, so you go and look at their HR system and sort of analyze yeah. the people they have and what they, what what data do you use out of the corporation? Uh, so in, in every corporation, when when someone is uh, applying for a job, they'll come through an ATS system, or if they're um, working on an HR technology for payroll and benefits. Um, for us, we just we just look at. Um, uh, you know, name, what you'd see on a resume, basically. So we're not interested in anything else. We're just interested in the type of information we'd see on a resume. And then from there, we're able to extract uh, profiles, just like you did with your resume. Mm -hmm. We do that at a macro level for a company. And then from there, we're able to aggregate that data. And we're able to see what's happening at a company level. So what are the strengths in customer service? What are the strengths in sales skills? What are the strengths in, in engineering, particular engineering skills, et cetera? And where are the gaps? And so what does the industry look like? I mean, we do a lot of work in chemical and, and uh, petrochemical engineering, uh, these types of things. And, and, you know, there's every company has a different skill set. 
And that's the really cool part of Skyhive is that we're able to see those different skill sets because we're not looking at industries on a job level. We're able to go and understand them at a very deep level. And so uh, an engineer title in one company, a petrochemical engineer in one company is not the same in another company. And so understanding those differences is really cool. I have the feeling you get to know the company at an intimate level that might almost be uncomfortable for them. Well, I think that the, it's information that's really important for, I, I think where this has gone in terms of the issues facing the future of work, it's really now to the, to the C-suite level. It's really now to strategic decision making. The workforce of the next five, 10 years is very, very relevant to the P&L, to the future business strategy of the company. My argument would be it always has been, but I think now there's a much clearer line that's, that's very uh, apparent. And a great example of that would be electric vehicles. And so you see this in the auto industry right now where, uh, you know, the workforce of 2023 in the auto, uh, you know, in the uh, big automotive manufacturing companies is completely different than it is today. But you're also dealing with a situation where there's, no, there's nobody to hire because unemployment is so low. And so you have to look at the skills of your workforce and you have to get folks reskilled and ready for non-combustible engines, possibility of autonomous vehicles, these types of things. It's a totally different skill set than making combustible engines with, with you know, human-driven cars, et cetera. So um, I think now the information is kind of mandatory and, and if it's available for people, then why not, right? I was. I started this kind of thought with the corporations thinking about how much of this do you actually need the corporation's data versus how much you actually can find publicly by looking their job descriptions and what they look for and so forth. So there, I, I believe there must be a big part you can actually do even without their data. Do you do that? Yeah, so we, we look at uh, tens of millions of data points in what we call the labor market. So mm -hmm. job postings, job sure. uh, you know, CVs, training programs, websites with job profiles, et cetera. And from there, we're extracting what we call uh, real life. And so what this means is, um, you know, if we're looking at the, going back to the title, project manager, you know, you may have a company and you call project manager one thing, but we have thousands of data points that create a bell curve of what a project manager actually is. And so neither one of those is the right answer but that having that information is very important. And so our clients and our user experience will actually upload their job description and we provide them with a snapshot of what skills came out of your job description, but what skills are actually in the labor market. And they can choose almost like a menu of skills to create that job based on what they actually need from a skill set perspective. So I want to get to the last part and this is sort of the end of our interview anyhow, but um I feel like I'm not getting into deep water here, but maybe we can navigate it together because what came up for me was the data you have and the information you have um, has a lot of uh, demographic, geographic, and therefore also in a way political, not politics, but political impact. If I am uh, the leader of a, of a city or a leader of an area or of something like this, there's got to be some really useful information that you have there too. Uh, how do you interact with those groups and what's the sort of thought around this? I know you talked about Latinos and uh, other demographics. Talk a little bit about that. How does that play out for you and how do you deal with keeping the ethical part of AI, I would argue? Yeah, so for us we do work with governments, but it's really about helping them with um, real-time labor market information that can drive policy making and economic uh, development initiatives. And so an example would be uh, we worked with the Government of Canada on supporting the recruitment, increasing the recruitment of women into the Canadian Armed Forces. And so we provided data that helped them correlate military jobs with civilian jobs and, and identify high correlation jobs uh, to military jobs. And so a, a real crude example would be that a yoga instructor is actually a very high correlated skills match to six jobs within the Canadian military and he or she wouldn't have had an idea that that was possible. And so that's certainly a career pathway. Uh, in other cases we're looking at things like working with indigenous communities and capturing skills uh, on what we call experiential learning. And so there's a lot of um, 
uh, social problems within indigenous communities where members of the community leave reserve, end up in an urban environment and sort of feel not at home, not, you know, and, and, and end up out of the uh, formal um, learning system or the formal uh, employment system and then they end up coming back at some point and want to be put on a pathway. So we work to map the culture specific skills through um, dance, art, history, uh, communication and map those across the labor market to help find employability skills and formal education pathway skills. So we're doing work like this in, in terms of applying our technology to communities. So um, we're happy to work with governments really it's about helping with frictional unemployment, structural unemployment and providing information that can help them uh, better prepare communities for, for the future of work. Have you run into situations that you didn't want to do? Yes, yeah absolutely. Yeah. What would be an example of that? Um, there's there's uh, requests we've had from militaries, there's, there's things where we're not comfortable helping advance a workforce that's focused on things that are you know, on, on, on a workforce that maybe is, is not being mobilized for the good of, of, of humanity. Do you personally um, get involved in those decisions? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I mean if somebody in the company is going to turn down uh, a client, certainly I'm going to have an answer, you know, I'm going to have to decide one way or the other. But yeah, I mean, and that's a part of our B Corp commitments and it's a part of our, our governance structure that, you know, we're we're doing things in the best interest of, of humanity. So it's constantly weighing that. Thank you so much for talking with me. I have to tell you, fascinating conversation, fascinating company, and thank you for doing what you do. Thanks, sir. I appreciate it's it. It's a pleasure meeting you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. And with that, we're coming to the end of another Coffee with Mr. IoT. If you missed part of today's conversation or any past conversations, please check out our playlist. And don't forget to subscribe. I don't know, up, down. Thank you for watching.